Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The second reading is from St. Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, the first chapter. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. This is the gospel of the Lord.
God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. St. John the Evangelist writes, Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Amen. Called, gathered, and enlightened by the Holy Spirit, we too wish to see Jesus. Why else are we here? if not expecting and desiring to see Jesus. And indeed, here is where we do see Jesus. We see him with the eyes of faith as we hear his holy word. We even see him in the bread and wine as his word is connected to those elements that give us his body to eat and his blood to drink for the forgiveness of our sins. That body that once hung upon the cross Glorified is now handed out so that we too might be glorified in God through his work for our sakes. You see, here is where we find our Lord revealed. Here is where we hear how he was high and lifted up through the preaching of the cross. As the Apostle Paul emphasized in his letter to the Corinthians, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. It is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, this preaching of the cross has been the central message of the Christian faith for 2,000 years. In fact, it is the message of the Bible that goes clear back to Genesis. As we hear of the Lord's eventual suffering and death in the curse that was placed upon that evil serpent, the devil. Then later, 2,000 years ago, Jesus himself told his disciples and the Greeks who wanted to speak with him. that Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And you are the fruit of that sacrifice. For if Christ had not died on the cross, you would still be in your sins. You would not believe in him if it were not for his sacrifice. If he was just another man who died, it would mean nothing for you and your salvation. But it was God's son who hung upon the cross. The lamb of God who poured out his blood for you and I and for our salvation and for the sins of the whole world. This is the message in which we glory and give glory to God. For without the Lord fulfilling his father's will by going to the cross, suffering, dying and rising again, we have no savior and are still eternally lost and condemned. And so we celebrate Holy Cross Day. It was nearly 1,700 years ago, Helena, the mother of Emperor Constantine, went to great efforts to find the cross on which our Lord was lifted up during his time of suffering. Tradition says that as they were digging around looking for the place where Jesus was crucified, they found three crosses and presumed that one of them must have been the cross on which our Lord hung. That was in September of 320 A.D., Now, there's nothing wrong with historical artifacts. It's fascinating to think of seeing the wood upon which our Lord was nailed. It's interesting to think of going to Jerusalem and seeing that place where he was lifted up. But none of that does anything for your salvation. You see, today, too many people think a historic relic is just as interesting as the gospel. Maybe even more interesting than the preaching of Christ and him crucified. Too many people aren't satisfied with the word of the cross alone that says Jesus died for our sins. Not many people are excited to hear the word of God, to come into our Lord's presence, 
to marvel at what he does through water and the word and holy baptism, or what he does hand out, which is the bread of life and the holy supper. In fact, even we at times may be like the people of Israel during their time in the wilderness, grumbling against God and against his servants, saying, hey, we loathe this worthless food, and we have no water to drink. It's tempting even for us, the baptized, to take for granted what Christ does in revealing himself to, some, to us in something as foolish as water and the word or bread and wine. The wise can't understand these things. The discerning want to know how it happens, and that leads to all kinds of confusion in the church and false teaching. But we who trust Christ in his word simply take what he says and believe it. He says, baptism now saves you. St. Paul, speaking the words that Christ gave him, says this is a washing of regeneration. St. Peter said that it now saves you and your children because it brings forgiveness. St. Paul said that through baptism you've been connected to Christ and what he did on the cross. You see, these are spiritual things that must come to us as a gift from God. For the wise and the discerning mind can never figure these things out. How is it that that bread and wine could be anything more than just a snack? It's the word. Take and eat. This is my body. Take and drink. This is my blood. And it's that word that divided us from other Protestants. Because the other Protestants don't believe that water can do anything. They don't believe that that bread and wine can be anything other than a snack. A stale cracker and a sip of sour grape juice. But we know better. Christ, who was crucified, who has drawn us to himself, who has called us by the gospel, has revealed to us that these things are not foolish. It's not just plain water. It's not just bread and wine. It is living water flowing from the hand of God himself to wash away our sins. It is the bread of life because Christ himself chooses to place his glorified body there in, with, and under those elements. In Luther's day, his prince... Duke Frederick the Wise was obsessed with relics because he had been told by the wise of the church that they could bring blessings and even God's grace and forgiveness by venerating, praying to, and even touching them. Frederick had purchased such a large collection of relics that venerating them all would remove 1,902,000 years from a person's time in purgatory, as if the Bible taught such a thing. In 1518, he had collected more than 17,000 items, including a thumb from St. Anne, a twig from Moses' burning bush, hay from the holy manger, and even milk from the Virgin Mary. And that wasn't all. Two pieces of the veil of Mary, which was sprinkled with the blood of Christ under the cross. One piece of the diaper with which Jesus himself was wrapped. All of these things were supposedly found in Wittenberg. 13 pieces of the manger of Jesus, one piece of the spun with which the Lord was given vinegar and gall, and on and on and on. And no matter how many relics you pile up, no matter how fascinating they might be, they cannot save. Only God-given faith in Christ alone, through the preaching of the cross, the preaching of the gospel, can save you. You see, only faith in what Jesus did in shedding his blood for us on the cross can do anything for us. And so as we near the 500th anniversary celebrating the beginning of the Lutheran Reformation, it's amazing to see that the more things change, the more they remain the same. Just last week, a vial of the blood of Pope John Paul II was here in Des Moines. It was here to be venerated by by faithful Catholics. People being interviewed said, it's amazing, I can feel his presence. They laid their rosaries and trinkets on the relic so that whatever blessing John Paul could give them would rub off, resulting in what the Catholic Church refers to as third-class relics. Families were praying to the dead Pope, asking him to bless their children, families, and marriages. And dear Christians, this would be creepy and just plain weird if it were not for the fact that it is pure idolatry, blasphemy, and against Christ to do such a thing. Remember the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before you. 
and how we should fear and love and trust in God above all things. And also remember the second commandment is mean that you should not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember that we teach and believe that we should fear and love God so that we do not swear, curse, use satanic arts, lie or deceive by his name. But call upon it in every trouble. Pray, praise and give thanks. You see, we despise the true gifts of God when we find relics and feelings more enticing and compelling than marveling at the preaching of the cross. In fact, the Pope whom so many adore. And I'm not trying to mock or say that he was a bad person, but his coffin was adorned with a large M for Mary. And his devotion to Mary was well known. His personal motto was totally yours. And he was referring to the Virgin. Compare the Pope's devotion to Mary with the words we sang in Paul Gerhardt's great hymn, Upon the Cross Extended. This is our confession. Your cords of love, my Savior, bind me to you forever. I'm no longer mine. To you I gladly tender all that my life can render, and all I have to you resign. You see, as blessed among women as the Virgin Mary undoubtedly is, there is only one intercessor between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, as St. Paul wrote to Timothy. And so remember... God will not be mocked. His word is not to be added to or taken away from. It is not the blood of popes, but the blood of the Lamb of God sacrificed for you that saves. To take away from what Christ did on the cross is to invite disaster for both the hearer and the preacher. And of course, Jesus made this clear when our Lord warned his disciples in Matthew 18. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned into the depths of the sea. You see, to take for granted what God gives in the preaching of the gospel invites disaster and God's wrath on us no less than the people of God who brought it upon themselves when their grumbling against God brought fiery serpents into their midst. And yes, we, because of our sins, deserve nothing but death. We too deserve to be struck down The wages of sin is death. And yet, God uses these crosses in our lives. Suffering, disease, warfare, bloodshed, disaster. He uses them for our good. Because even as he did for the people of God, then he still does. He uses the cross in our life to turn us back to him in true repentance. To find our hope in him alone. And to rejoice in the mercy that he so freely gives. Now, to be fair, there are those who will accuse us of worshiping Luther and venerating his name and his words above the word of God. And that accusation may be true for those churches, pastors, and people who are Lutheran in name only, not recognizing the source of Luther's words. Because for us Lutherans, as it was for the Apostle Paul, it is the message of the gospel, the preaching of Christ and him crucified for us sinners that is still the central message of the church. You see, if we are Lutheran only for tradition's sake, then we might as well drag out the relics, go up to Minneapolis when the Luther exhibit goes by and pray to that beer stein of his. But we won't do that. Because we have something better, something real that is here now for us in our salvation. And that's the preaching of the cross. And in our hymns and liturgy, in our Bible studies and worship, in our Sunday school classrooms, this is what's always central. This message that Christ alone is the one who has defeated the devil, driven away the fiery serpent and his poison. By taking that poison of sin into his own flesh and becoming sin for us on the cross. You see, it's not anything good in us. It's not any decision we make or any feelings of the heart. What saves us is purely gifts flowing from the cross in the waters of holy baptism. And from our Lord's own hand in the Holy Supper, which he leaves with his church. Gifts which, again, seem so foolish to the wise and discerning of the world in these latter days. And so by the grace of God, we humble ourselves. 
We rejoice and glory in such wonderfully foolish things in the eyes of the world. The Lord said to Moses, after those serpents had swept through the camp and many had suffered and had been brought to repentance, asking Moses to pray for them, the Lord responded, say, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This makes no sense to human reason. They had tried that before, and it didn't work. It just brought God's judgment. Remember, the people were impatient when Moses was up on the mountain, so they made for themselves a golden calf, an idol to worship. So how could this be any different? How could a bronze serpent be better than a gold one of our own making? And yet when the Lord says, do this, when the Lord says, look to this, that his promises are connected to that element, there you have his promises fulfilled. For them, it was the healing of their bodies. For us, it's the healing of our soul. Not looking at a bronze serpent, but receiving the gifts of God. You see, Jesus told Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And you know the next verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. See, no veneration of relics, no bowing down, praying to the dead, but Christ alone. And this preaching is what saves. Because what Jesus was preaching there to Nicodemus and the example that he set forth before the people with that serpent is nothing less than the preaching of the cross for us and our salvation. Because without Christ and his word and his sacraments to cling to in faith, we would only have our own hearts and feelings to trust. And then we would never know our salvation and we would be left with uncertainty and doubt. Because again, none of this means anything if Christ did not die on the cross to pay for our sins. He alone is the one we wish to see and to whom we look to for our salvation. Stricken, smitten, despised by men, he glorified his father by sacrificing himself for Jew and Greek, the skeptic, the self-righteous, even for those who would not see Jesus as their savior and who would look to themselves rather than him. You see, Jesus died for us and for the sins of the whole world. He even died for those who find their comfort misplaced in historic artifacts and relics. He even died for the blood of a poor, miserable, misguided sinner like the deceased Pope. But thanks be to God. We, who were once Gentiles and sinners, strangers and enemies of God because of our unbelief, by God, now see God for who he is, our only Savior. We see Jesus where he promises to be found, high and lifted up for all the world to see in the preaching of the cross, of Christ crucified for the sins of the world. We see him in the words spoken over you in the waters of your baptism, even as the Father spoke for our sakes, saying that that Jesus is our Savior and that he has been glorified. Because we know that God's gifts are never foolish. God's gifts are precious and pure. And it is through this preaching that we too have been drawn by the Lord who has been lifted up for us. We even sang with the church for the last 1,500 years. Sing, my tongue, the glorious battle. Sing the ending of the fray. Now above the cross, the trophy, sound the loud, triumphant lay. Tell how Christ, the world's redeemer, as a victim won the day. Faithful cross, true sign of triumph, be for all the noblest tree. None in foliage, none in blossom, none in fruit, thine equal be. Symbol of the world's redemption for the fruit that hung on thee. The fruit of your Lord has given you faith and salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy 
will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. service at Holy Cross Lutheran Church, Carlisle, Iowa. Join us this coming Sunday at the Divine Service, which begins at 9 a.m. Our Divine Service is followed by Adult Bible Study and Sunday School at 1030. You're also invited to join us for Vespers and Catechesis for the entire family on Wednesday evenings beginning at 6.30 p.m. We also gather for the morning prayer service of Matins on Thursday mornings at 9.30 a.m. Holy Cross is a member of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and is located at 1100 Market Street, Carlisle, Iowa.